Hello learners, welcome to the NIOS studios. I am Dr. Abha Sharma from School of Education, GT Goenka University. We are going to learn about some of the management approaches today. Education is being viewed as a key to change and advance, and advancement and flourishing of the nation releases on upon the sort of education that is given to the general population and the broadly useful of national educational planning in any nation is to help and encourage the improvement of the instructive framework. Planning in any country is to assist and facilitate the development of the educational system. The educational planning process typically includes the interaction of sets of activities and feedback loops, including a expressed vision of the future education sector, creation of the setting of objectives, the survey of existing educational approaches and thought of required new ones, clarification of projects, tasks and targets and evaluation of required human monetary and physical assets. So students we will just discuss about the types of management approaches today. It includes the introduction of management approaches, the types of management approaches which will include manpower requirement, cost benefit analysis, social demand and social justice. From educational planning point of view, there are four main types of management approaches. We will discuss about the theoretical formulations and the technicalities found in literature related to these types of management approaches. The first management approach is manpower requirement. The second is cost benefit analysis approach. The third is social demand approach and the fourth one is social justice approach. The manpower requirement approach according to this approach, education plans are made keeping in view the manpower requirements of the country or economy as a whole. While producing goods and services, there is need of labor to meet the population tasks. These may require the general education and special skills. When production process is simple, requirement of education and skill may be simple. When production is complex, it requires higher level of general education and skills which require special training. For example, production of hardware components in computer industry, mobile phones or medicines. The labor should not only be having a good level of general education but also a special type of skills which can be attained by special training. So, the educational planners by using their special knowledge and expertise work out for manpower requirement for production processes of different sectors of the economy. As we know that we are living in highly technological era, hence level of general education and professional level of working population in a country should be as per manpower requirement for more production and creating wealth. The application of the manpower planning approach depends on these factors. An appraisal and analysis of the existing employment conditions and the system of education. Planning the system of education vis a vis the manpower needs of the economy and using the financial resources which are very limited in an optimum way so as to fulfill the demands of the employment sector without incurring wastage on account of unemployment. Making an appraisal of the number of students enrolled, the number of existing teachers and their qualifications, enrollment in teacher education institutions, availability of future teachers as well as the existing number of school buildings, equipments, 
infrastructure and other facilities. The requirement of the employers regarding occupational and or professional qualifications for employees, the level of training and abilities should also be assessed. The manpower planning approach takes note of the fact that the teaching profession requires approximately 60% of the highly qualified human resource of a country which completes with the demand for manpower in other economic sectors. And in order to meet the future requirement of manpower, it is very necessary to educate and train youth in the country to meet this challenge. Thus, manpower requirement approach connects level of education and training with different types of level of occupation in the country. Next approach is cost-benefit analysis approach. It is presumed that additional school years as well as training on the job provides incremental benefits of awareness, skills and understanding in hope of getting a better and specific skills to both individual and the society. Gone are the days when education was considered as consumption activity of a leisure class. Now education is considered productive investment and the rapid expansion, upgrading and diversified manpower requirements due to technological advances in economy has brought pressure on demand for education. Moving to the concept of cost-benefit approach says that a particular good or service is produced at the cost of another good and service. A choice of alternative has to be sacrificed in order to achieve alternative or selected. Say for example, the families send their children to school. They pay fees and taxes. They are buyers of education. These families also forego income of their family members by sending them to school. The first type of expenditure is a direct cost to the families and the later type is called an opportunity cost. The money outlay of the education establishment for salaries, upkeep and maintenance charges, supplies of stores, depreciation etc. are again resource cost to the community. Here also the opportunity makes an investment in providing the education, investing somewhere else. Further, the education is provided to the individuals at very low cost by the government, whereas government expenditure on running the educational institutions is higher. It would imply that those who are receiving education may not be the real pay masters. Others are paying for their education through the devices of taxes. The free and compulsory universal elementary education that is from classes 1 to 8 in government schools, these children are getting free education whereas all expenditure is borne by the government. Benefits can be considered in two ways, economic or monetary benefits and non-monetary benefits. Say for example, monetary or economic benefits are the money earning of the individual over his or her span of working life. Non-monetary benefits may be considered indirect benefits like values of good citizenship, the knowledge, skills, attitudes towards work culture. In addition to the benefits of education to the individual, community, society or nation is also benefited by educated manpower since it increases direct economic benefits in terms of increased national income since productivity of the educated and skilled manpower is higher than the productivity of the illiterate manpower. The demand for education and training by the individual 
or by the society at large is based on cost benefit principle. See it in the Indian context how the in expansion of education, educational institutions, schools and colleges are going on. The next approach which we are going to discuss today is the social demand approach. This approach was used in the Robbins Committee report on higher education in Britain. In India too, this approach is a popular one while opening new schools and colleges in particular. In this method are involved the following steps to estimate the proportion of students completing school education and are likely to enter into higher education. To estimate how many of these successful school leaving students would actually apply for admission to colleges. To determine how many of the applicants should be given admission to higher education. To determine the length and duration of the study. Thus, the major issue involved in this approach is to forecast future demands for seats keeping in mind social and educational trends as well as demographic changes. The underlying assumptions in this approach is that expansion of education is beneficial to the economy and thus additional expenditure on education would not create a burden too heavy to bear. The social demand for education is raised by the economic development or vice versa. Economic development raises the standard of living and improves the quality of life in every country. This rising standards of living raises social expectations, awareness towards social equity. Different social groups makes a strong case for education and lead to raise voice for ensuring basic education that is the primary education as a human right. That is why in India after a long time after independence right to education act 2009 has been enacted and is being implemented from 1st of April 2010 throughout the country. The last approach is social justice approach. The Indian constitution aims at achieving social justice. The preamble of the Indian constitution does speak about the social justice. Government and legislatures makes laws and implement through various welfare schemes to achieve social justice by protecting the interest of disadvantaged sections of society. Scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, other backward classes, minorities, etc. This approach emphasizes justice to the disadvantaged sections of society and is based on Article 45 of the Indian Constitution. This approach is aimed at making special provisions for the socially economically and educationally disadvantaged communities for a longer duration. This includes opening ashram school for the tribal areas, special concessions and scholarships, incentives and relaxations. So today students we have learned about types of management approaches which includes manpower requirement, cost benefit analysis, social demand and social justice. Thank you.